Thank you so much, Nick, uh, for the great performance. This is a Dr. Nicholas Ann, who is our highly valued and multi-talented research fellow, and who is ethnomusicologist, composer, performer, playing piano, arhu, zhonghu, hulusi, and his lecturer. So what you have just heard is some of his, some of his own composition and also some in classical Chinese. Uh, also, the photos you have seen from the slideshow uh, are currently provided by Professor Nicholas Jones and artist uh, Liu Xiaoxian and some from Guangwei. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Australian China Institute for Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University and to our 2021 annual address on Parramatta South Campus. Uh, it is so pleasing to see people in three dimensions and we are very lucky that we can still do this event uh, you know, in person, which make a huge difference. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that today's event is being held on the country of the Darug people of the Darug Nation and acknowledge their ancestors who have been the traditional owners of the country for thousands of years. We would also like to acknowledge and pay respect to uh, Darug people's elders, past, present, and emerging. My name is Jing Han. I'm the director of this institute and MC today. Prior to this job, I have worked at SBS for 23 years, leading SBS subtitling department. I treasure my learning and contributions at uh, SBS, where diverse and multicultural values are not just promoted, but lived through each and every one of us. Uh, bringing in and embracing cultures from all over the world. No culture is an old one out. And um, culture is a living thing. So a living culture needs constant transformations, drawing on new and different sources to make it livelier, richer, vibrant, um, and everlasting. So today we are so privileged to have Professor Nicholas Jews to give the annual address on the importance of arts, of the arts. And also because of Nick and through Nick, we have uh, the fortune of having invited six highly distinguished guest speakers. Uh, we will introduce Nick and guest speakers shortly. Um, doing arts and culture needs a lot of support. Uh, Western Sydney University is a very large university with 59,000 students, 3,500 staff, 12 schools, 11 campuses, six institutes, one college, and a number of divisions. So Vice-Chancellor is there for the whole university, and we all want the Vice-Chancellor's support. <laughs> so on behalf of the institute and the people who work in the arts and culture, I'm immensely grateful to the Vice-Chancellor for his consistent support to the Institute and to what we do. Growing up in China, I have learned one thing by heart since I was a child. When you have two pears, not sure why not apples, but when you have two pears, one is big, one is small. You give away the bigger one to others and you keep the smaller one for yourself. So, I will leave the bigger pair to the Vice-Chancellor. Please welcome the Vice-Chancellor and the President of Western Sydney University, Professor Barney Glover Ayo, to give the opening speech. Thank you, Jing. I appreciate that introduction. That was lovely. Um, and I appreciate the pair. So, thank you. Thank you for that. The bigger pair of the two. So, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to be here. And, uh, uh, wonderful to have an opportunity uh, to get together. As Jing said a moment ago, if we were in Melbourne, this wouldn't be happening right now. So our thoughts go out to people, not just in Victoria, coping with uh, COVID at the moment, because as much as we'd like to think we're in a post-pandemic period, we're not. COVID will be with us and coronaviruses for a long, long time. And what we see happening overseas, of course, is devastating. So we need to put it in perspective, but we're fortunate that uh, New South Wales has navigated this pandemic to date so well, and we hope it continues that way, so we can continue to meet like this, enjoy each other's company, and have a celebration like this today. And I'm really pleased that I could join you and say a few words at the beginning. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the 
the Baromedical people of the Darug Nation to acknowledge their elders past and present, and particularly to welcome anyone of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent who's with us in the audience today. A particular welcome to you. Uh, to everyone else, welcome to Western Sydney University's Australia-China Institute for Arts uh, and Culture 2021 annual address. It's great to have an opportunity to welcome you all here. I need to say a few words about special guests who are with us and, uh, and distinguished guests who are joining us today. Uh, the Consul, Cultural Affairs of the Consulate General of the People's Republic of China, Ms Xu Yu Wang is with us. Lovely to have you with us, Consul. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, of course, Professor Nicholas Jose, who is going to deliver the 2021 address in a moment, so uh, we won't hold you in suspense for too long, and we'll hear the, cult the address very, very soon. Uh, and as Jing pointed out, we have a number of uh, special guest speakers as well, uh, and I'm pleased to welcome all of them. Lovely to see Dr. Jean Sherman AM with us today, great supporter of Western Sydney University. Uh, and in my notes, it says Australian cultural icon and philanthropist. So wonderful to have you here, Jean, and that is very apt. <laughs> great to see you, though. Um, renowned Chinese Australian artist, Guam Wei, who can't be with us because he's, of course, unfortunately in Melbourne. Uh, but Lu Xiao Xian is also with us, so welcome to you. Um, now, we have video uh, presentations a little later from Professor Li Yao and Professor Wang Jingwei from China, who will appear via video pre-recorded. And, of course, we also have not pre-recorded in any way um, Professor Ivor Indic from uh, the uh, Western Sydney University Whitlam Chair, and Ivor will be presenting a little later. So welcome to all of our guest uh, speakers. We have a number of members of the ASEAC board with us, and important to note that. So uh, we have with us Kevin Hopgood-Brown AM, wonderful to see Kevin here, Annette Chu Hua, uh, of course Sally Beaumont, and distinguished Professor Ian Ang. And Jocelyn Shea is here. So Jocelyn, wonderful to see you as always. Our Foundation Director, Professor Jocelyn Shea, who is here with us today. Great to see you, Jocelyn. Um, we have a number of other university supporters with us. Highly respected expert in Chinese art and culture, Associate Professor Claire Roberts from Melbourne Uni. I hope Claire is here. Is Claire here? Claire, welcome. I was hoping you were here and not um, unfortunately trapped in Melbourne. Contemporary Chinese art writer and researcher uh, Lewis Guest, our former councillor for uh, public affairs and culture at the Australian Embassy in Beijing, Marie Ringland, and director of Chinese art at the New South Wales Art Gallery, uh, Chow Yin. And of course, a number of colleagues from the university. So welcome, and also from the community. And great to see Josephine Lamb here as well. Josephine, great to see you with us. Now, we are honoured, very honoured, in fact, to have Professor Nick Jost deliver the 2021 annual address. It goes without saying, and a quick look at the, the um, screen a little earlier, is it still cycling behind me? No, it's not, of um, incredible photographs. You get a sense of um, just how outstanding a scholar, diplomat, novelist, essay writer, playwright, educator and researcher Nick is, so it's wonderful to have you with us. You're a great supporter of the university and the institute. Uh, Nick studied at the Australian National University and went on to receive his PhD from Oxford in 1978. He taught English literature at the Australian National University for seven years, then at the Beijing Foreign Studies University and China East Normal University in 1986, before he served as the cultural counsellor of the Australian Embassy in Beijing from 1987 to 1990. During that time, which was known in China as a period of culture fever, Nick discovered many contemporary Chinese artists and introduced them to Australia including Wang Wei and Lu Xiaoxian. After returning to Australia, Nick continued promoting contemporary Chinese art and collaborated closely with key figures in the contemporary art field, including Dr. Jean Sherman. As history has illustrated, contemporary artists from China have fundamentally changed and enriched the contemporary art scene in Australia. Nick has written and published 13 books, including a number of novels, Paper Nautilus, Avenue of Eternal Peace, which has been shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Award, The Custodians, which has been shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize, and Original Face. Two short story collections, a volume of essays, Chinese Whispers, and the memoir, Black Sheep. He was general editor of the Macquarie Pen Anthology of Australian Literature, and his recent publications as co-editor 
include Antipodean China, Reflections on Literary Exchange, which was published this year, and Everything Changes, Australian Writers in China, a transcultural anthology published in 2020. Uh, I am pleased that Antipodean China will be launched at today's event in particular, so thank you, Nick, for that. Professor Jost has a long-standing connection with Western Sydney University, which we're very pleased about, particularly through the Writing and Society Research Centre, and I know many colleagues are in the room. He was pivotal, in fact, in establishing the most influential China-Australia Literary Forum in 2011, a biannual ongoing program between the China Writers Association and Western Sydney University. At the third forum in 2013 in Beijing, Nick brought together two Nobel Prize winners for literature, Mo Yan and J.M. Coetzee. Uh, so important at the moment that we uh, reflect on and support the bilateral dialogue between Australia and China. It's never been more important. I'm sure Nick will make comment in, in relation to that in his address a little later. The 2021 address in particular focuses on the importance of the arts. Arts play an indispensable role in civilization, in civic society, in human society, and are effective in bridging and connecting different cultures and deepening interactions between countries. Under the current geopolitical climate, arts and culture are becoming more important than ever in continuing long established relations and exchanges between our countries. ASEAN was established to enable the development of deeper ties in China, with China through open intellectual and dynamic engagement with centuries old and emerging Chinese arts and culture. The Institute has made some remarkable achievements. Its innovative audiovisual art exhibition, Coronavirus in Children's Eyes, was featured in the ABC's breakfast program. In December 2020, an inaugural online dialogue between 10 prominent Australian and Chinese writers on the theme Pandemic, Reflection, Creation was co-hosted with the China Writers Association. It was a great success and very timely. In addition, the Contemporary Australian Literature Translation Program has been set up, sponsored by the Foundation of Australian Studies in China. It features indigenous writing and works by Asian Australians. The director of the Institute, the indomitable, indefatigable, Professor Jing Han, a distinguished subtitler and literary translator, has completed the Chinese translation of the Miles Franklin award-winning novel Too Much Lip by Indigenous writer Melissa Lukashenko. Professor Li Yao, whose video we'll see a little later, is currently translating another Miles Franklin award-winning novel, The Yield, by Tara June Witch. In collaboration with the Belvoir Theatre, the Institute is producing a new play, Miss Peony, with trilingual sub subtitles, English, Cantonese, and Mandarin, the first trilingual production in this country. ASEAC welcomes opportunities to engage and collaborate with the diverse communities and organisations. And I must pay tribute to Jing. That was a great act to follow from Jocelyn. And Jing has done a remarkable job, I think, in taking ASEAC to yet another level. So welcome, everyone. Great to have you all here. I'm certainly looking forward to hearing from Nick in a moment and hearing his address and our other speakers. And thank you for, all, for uh, coming along this evening and supporting the Australia-China Institute for Arts and Culture 2021 Annual Address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice-Chancellor, for, for the great opening speech and again for the support. Although Guan Wei is not able to be with us, I would still like to introduce him. Uh, Wang Wei is the first, first guest speaker, and he's a very well-known and revered contemporary uh, artist, um, so revered that whenever I'm with him, I can't help thinking of a Chinese idiom, hu jia hu wei, meaning a fox uses a tiger's power by walking alongside the tiger to scare away all the other animals. Well, I have no intention of using one way's uh, the power for any ulterior, uh, ulterior motive, but I do enjoy the attention that doesn't belong to me. Guan Wei has an incredibly intelligent and lucid mind and delightful sense of humor. When I showed him the proceeding of the event, he said, I thought I'd speak after Nick Jones. I said, no, you will be like Andre, and Nick Jones will be the main cause. And he said, I see, we will be the spring rolls, and Nick will be the steak. 
So I was so looking forward to, you know, seeing his spring roll, but unfortunately he just called me. He went to Melbourne two days ago to open his new, uh, new exhibition and just being caught by the, you know, outbreak. He just got back, but for the caution, and he decided to stay at home rather than coming here. So that's... So we will have another opportunity to uh, hear one with many, many interesting stories. And then I move on to introduce our next guest speaker and iconic uh, figure in Australian arts and culture and philanthropy, Dr. Jean Sherman AM. Dr. Jean Sherman, if you haven't met her in person to today, you must, uh, you know, very likely to have heard of her. She has had an amazing career uh, for so many years across many areas, hence has had many hats. She was the chair, the director of Sherman Galleries for 21 years and uh, the uh, di di executive director and the chair of Sherman Contemporary Art Foundation for nine years and is now the founder and uh, artistic director of the Sherman Center for Culture and Ideas. I took this photo uh, last month uh, at the um, Art uh, Architecture Hub, which was hosted by the Sherman Center for Culture and Ideas in partnership with Western Sydney University. And uh, uh, Dr. Sherman talked about 30 minutes, and this puppy sat there quietly throughout, <laughs> clearly mesmerized as we were all by Dr. Sherman's talk. So it was, to me, it was a, such a visual reflection of Dr. Jean Sherman's charm, eloquence, kindness, and generosity. So please welcome Dr. Jean Sherman AM. Well, to be upstaged by your dog. <laughs> I had to leave the little dog alone today. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't a happy camper. Thank you so much, and Barney, thank you for uh, recognizing the importance of this institute uh, and everything that it does. Uh, Nick's importance, which is really hard to put into words, but I'm going to uh, try. Uh, right now. So good evening, good afternoon everybody. It's a, a great honour to be here, to, be, to have been invited to participate in this annual address for the Australia-China Institute for Arts and Culture and the address could not be delivered by a more important colleague, friend and in a way person in my life which I'll uh, outline, the reasons for which I'll outline in a moment. I'm really delighted, I, this was a prepared thing, although I don't write my speeches, but I thought I was speaking in the same forum as one way, and one way is caught up in a COVID issue. Um, but I feel his presence here, and you'll feel his presence a little bit as I share some thoughts with you. And this is why Nick uh, Guanwei and uh, Dr. Claire Roberts are really inextricably bound into my own cultural <coughs> journey. Um, and this journey involved moving from a Eurocentric understanding of the world, uh, uh, that was the understanding of the world in which I grew up, although I grew up in Africa. So if I looked out of the window, there was Africa. And if I looked inside our home, it felt like Europe. That was really my world. And I moved from uh, that world to an Asia-focused professional life, uh, which started 34 years ago and continues today. Um, most, uh, some of you, I know many people in the audience, not all of you, but my academic life and my brief secondary school teaching life was really oriented towards France, which is my second language, and to some extent towards French-speaking Africa. We did, we were already teaching uh, the, la uh, the literatures of the, the French-speaking world, uh, particularly in North and West Africa. How did I come to meet Nick? And what was his influence on me that I described a few minutes ago, personally and professionally? Well, when our family arrived from uh, South Africa, we came via London, it's a long story and we don't have time for it, and I, I wouldn't bore you with it, but when our family arrived finally in Australia in 1976, Australia was already pivoting towards Asia. 
Sydney University at the time had the largest um, European or Department of European Languages, Literatures and Culture, and following the British model, that department was the French department. Just to put it in perspective, we had 800 students, uh, which was a lot. Um, uh, and they sat in big auditoriums uh, for the most part with some tutorials. But by the time, I remember this is 1976, by 1980 81, it became patently and absolutely clear to me that I needed to change my professional focus if I wanted a career in this new uh, country and continent. I would need to become Asia literate, I'd need to set my compass differently, I'd need to explore new ideas, ideas that I'd not encountered, new realities, new histories and new ways of being in the world. Literature had been my profession up to that point and my leisure time passion uh, uh, was the visual arts. So I took my profession, and that became my leisure time passion, literature, and I took visual arts, which was my leisure time passion, and that became my profession. I simply swapped things around. And that's what I do, you know, literature and the visual arts. So what did I do in order to uh, transfer from literature, my teaching life, to uh, my new passion, the visual arts, and a feeling that I needed to become Asia literate was I opened a gallery. And I focused on the art of the Asia Pacific, uh, on Australian artists of Asian origin, but of course also on other Australian artists, many of whom uh, came from the Middle East uh, or from Anglo, the Anglo-Celtic world or from Europe. But the focus was on the Asia Pacific in one way or another. Enter Nick Jones who at the time had recently been cultural council, uh, councillor, like a, a cultural attaché, I would always say, uh, as, ba as uh, Professor uh, uh, Barney mentioned, at the Australian Embassy in Beijing. And my life, when Nick entered my life, my life changed dramatically in a moment. Simultaneously, almost simultaneously, other people entered my life, and uh, two of them were to be here today, Guan Wei No, because of what we know, and Liu Xiaoshen. Uh, he entered my life with Arsien as well, three artists. Uh, we called um, Liu Xiaoshen uh, Shannon Liu at first because we had no idea how to pronounce the X uh, that, that was written in the Roman script. And they clambered up the stairs into my office in the gallery, and my life together with meeting Nick, shifted its course a little bit more. And then Claire Roberts entered, all within the same period. Uh, she was then curator of Asian Decorative Arts at the Powerhouse Museum. And after meeting Claire, hers was the first actual intervention in my new career. And she curated two exhibitions at Sherman Gallery on Chinese contemporary art in 1991 and 1992. One was called Behind, uh, Beyond the Bamboo Curtain and the other was Orientations, the Emperor's New Clothes. And my pathway was really reset by that point. So there was Nick, there were the three artists and there was Claire. Today is about Nick, about Nick's monumental contribution to Australian cultural life about Nick's quiet, persistent, thoughtful, elegant interventions in the fabric of Australians' intellectual reservoirs, really, one could say. Uh, Nick, as um, uh, the Vice Chancellor has mentioned, has written extensively. He's written a number of novels, all of which I've read, hand on heart, uh, essays, not all of which I've read, some of them catalogue essays on specific exhibitions, and many of those I've read, but he's written also general essays on literature, on writing, on publishing, and so on. He's delivered lectures, he's guided artists, he's undertaken research, and there are people here, particularly Ivor, who will uh, talk uh, shortly, but who are much better qualified than I am to comment on the, the breadth of Nick's career, his academic career, uh, his uh, career as an author's, author and as a cultural impresario. So this part of Nick's life and career that I've only sort of looked at as an observer. 
But the books that I read, the ones that have stuck in my mind, uh, and these are the novels I'm talking about, fictional work, was Avenue of Eter uh, Eternal Peace in 89, The Rose Crossing, which I'll come back to in a minute, in 94, The Red Thread, which was particul particular fun in 2000, Chinese Whispers, in, uh, which was a collection of essays a little earlier, uh, all of those dealing, by the way, with Chinese subjects. And then Bapo, which I was pleased to see is actually on the table here, uh, a collection of short stories. And I'm going to take the liberty, if I'm allowed to, if people feel I'm going on too long, I'll leave it out, but to read a little paragraph from uh, Bapo, because it relates indirectly to Guanwei. My journey with Nick... Uh, is really anchored though, uh, look, I could have said a million things. I mean, I've been involved with these people for so long, across so many different platforms, I could have been here all night. But I did, you know, I, want to, I needed to and I, I, it was imperative that I made uh, choice, choices. So I decided just to talk about two seminal, uh, at least seminal for me projects, uh, where Nick was uh, involved and where I was connected to him. And the most important of the two, certainly the, the lengthiest of the two, was based uh, on an exhibition, well, was an exhibition called The Rose Crossing, which traveled through Asia and Australia in 1999-2000. It uh, went to six venues, uh, Brisbane City Gallery, Hong Kong Art Centre, Singapore Art Museum, uh, the Home Support, it was a small gallery in Perth, uh, privately funded, uh, obviously, by the Home Support family, the S.H. Irving Gallery and Campbelltown Art Centre in Sydney. Campbelltown Art Centre had a different name then, but uh, it now Campbelltown Art Centre. And then the other involvement with Nick, which was in a way as significant but not as uh, sort of deeply embedded, was his involvement in Go East. I want to talk very quickly first about the Rose Crossing. Nick published a book called, wrote, and published a book called The Rose Crossing in 94-95. It was translated into French, uh, uh, and I read it in both languages separately. I actually adored it in French. I loved it in English, but I adored it in French. Sorry, Nick. I don't know. There was something about that book in French that just was perfection. It had a different title in French. It wasn't called The Rose Crossing. You know how languages don't, you all know, sitting in this audience, don't uh, translate literally. It was called A la recherche d'une rose noire, which means in search of a black rose uh, in the French translation. And it tells the tale of two vessels, two ships and a uh, human cargo uh, who converge shipwrecked on an unnamed desert island. One ship was going from England to the west to the east and the other ship from the east to the west. And there were two young people and two older people on board. Uh, the young couple, the heart of the book, the daughter, was a, 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 a young woman, daughter of an educated Englishman who was deeply interested in horticulture, you can see the link with the rose, and the uh, young uh, uh, protagonist going on the ship from China to Europe was the heir, the last heir of the Ming dynasty, set in the 17th century. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but the, the, the some symbolism uh, of the book, which sort of underpins it, uh, a little bit like the symbolism of the plague by Camus, which is a very prescient book at the moment, and I've just reread, uh, had a, a symbolism that had nothing to do with its medical side. Here, the symbolism, east-west, was embodied in the personages of these two young people. And out of this union and related to it, side by side with it, was a hybrid rose, the rose of the title. Well, I was very inspired by this book, in English and in French. And I decided to do an exhibition based on it, also called The Rose Crossing, called the Rose Crossing with Nick's permission. The show was curated by William Wright, the late William Wright, who was curatorial director of Sherman Galleries for 14 years, with Nick's uh, participation and mine, and an essay at the time by John Clark, Professor John Clark, who was then at Sydney University, retired now. 
And we showcased work by John Olson, for example. He was 70 then, he's in his 90s now. Samandari van Puthorn, a group of Australian artists of Asian origin, including Guan Wei, John, all of whom I'm in contact with still, John Young, who's in Melbourne, Miley Tai, Hussein Valamanesh from the Middle East, from Iran, and then there was a group of Anglo um, uh, uh, artists, Australian artists of Anglo heritage, like John Woolsley and Michael Johnson and Iman Stillers. And all of these people are still part of my life in, in varying ways. I saw Iman the night before last. Um, well, we had a huge amount of fun with this travelling show. I learnt a huge amount, but like being thrown in the deep end about international freight, about differing cultural protocols, because we went to Singapore and Hong Kong, we were in different places, uh, about translation pitfalls. Uh, it's a long story and I won't tell it, but I learnt a lot about the... <laughs> about Chinese simplified and complex characters. Just let me put it as simply as that. It was a nightmare, a complete nightmare. But we uh, corrected all the mistakes we made just in time. There were also installation challenges because with every museum or space that we went to, uh, they, were, they were differently resourced and different in scale. And we had to refashion the exhibition uh, for a year and a half as it traveled. Nick was the anchor. The Rose Crossing was our compass. His vision was our guiding light. That was what the exhibition was about. It was about the Rose Crossing and the symbolism that was built into the book, the novel, this work of fiction and embodied in the artwork. Then he made a contribution, this is short and I'm almost finishing, to Go East. Go East was another project altogether. I've just chosen two. It was less obvious contribution uh, as far as we were concerned, but it was equally significant and it included Claire. It was incredibly prescient in, in many ways. And in uh, Go East, uh, we um, incorporated a short story by Nick called Ha Ha Ha, which had been published in the collection, the anthology Bapo, which is outside here on a table, that Iva Indic uh, published, the University of Western Sydney in 2014. And uh, Nick paints, but in words, a portrait of an artist who very gently deflects with smiles and humor uh, a questioning, quite harsh questioning, pointed rather than harsh maybe, by national security focused Chinese bureaucrats. And uh, one, it, it's unmistakably one way. I mean, anybody who knows one way sees one way in that story, but it is a fictional story. So it's probably a composite of one way and other people. And we actually reprinted that short story in the catalog for Go East. Now, uh, just a shout out to Claire because Go East was shown at the Art Gallery of New South Wales and also at the Sherman Contemporary Art Foundation. And part of Go East was a monumental work that Brian and I had acquired, Brian, my husband, and I had acquired called Chinese Bible. I think the most important work we have ever acquired in our 53 years of collecting art, now gifted to the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And Claire Roberts um, uh, curated in her absolutely, you know, beyond excellent way, uh, Chinese Bible, which was also part of Go East. So I'm bringing Nick and Claire together, Nick together with me, Claire together with me, and painting a portrait of how interconnected we all were. So um, to conclude, I'd like to read a paragraph from Ha Ha Ha. I might shorten it a little bit because there are others following me. And in doing so, though, I do want to pay tribute to Nick as a writer, um, the Vice Chancellor has mentioned, a writer and author, an academic and intellectual, a mentor, a treasured Australian whose knowledge of and links to China are even more precious now than they have been over the past 40 years. I think I'm going to honestly do something informal. Would you? Pr I don't need to read the ha ha ha. I didn't realize it was here. You can go and get the book and read it for yourself. And I'll, let's move on to the next person. Thank you 
so much to Dr. Jean Sherman. As I promised, it's always fascinating listening to Dr. Jean Sherman. And obviously, she has a set all, all the things for Guan Wei as well. So I'm sure Guan Wei is smiling at home. <laughs> Our next guest speaker is also a highly talented artist, Liu Xiaoxian. Um, when I first saw this artwork by Xiaoxian, I said to myself, what a genius. We all know Jesus and Buddha separately, but putting them next to each other and call it our gods, it is truly a picture that speaks a thousand words. All uh, Xiaoxian's artworks are very powerful and impactful. Once you see it, you want the, the impact to stay with you forever. And many of his work have been collected by art galleries and museums. And uh, currently, Xiaoxian is exhibiting in The Way We Eat uh, at New South Wales Art Gallery, curated by Cao Ying. Um, when Xiaoxian and I had a chat, we realized that we actually studied at neighboring universities with a little narrow street in between, with him being at Beijing Institute of Technology, Jinggong, and me at Beijing Foreign Studies University, Beiwai. We must have seen each other at Beigongchun. So never knowing, though, that we would meet 30 years later at Western Sydney University. Please welcome multi-talented artist Liu Xiaoxian. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xiao Tian. Um, I come from Beijing originally. Um, I got to know uh, Nick through my brother in the mid 80s in Beijing. This Nick got a lot of uh, artist friends. So we are among, among them. I talk about uh, some portraits that I did for me and Beijing. At the beginning, it's just uh, some snapshots took in different locations. This one of them, and he, I think he used this uh, for some of his publications at that time. He has uh, some other examples <laughs> of <laughs> And then later on, we kind of uh, choosing the uh, iconic um, background. <laughs> this one in particular is a model soldier in China, it's very famous, very fun. <laughs> Uh, 
me and party thing. Uh, and uh, my first exhibition was held in Nick's apartment uh, in the January I think, uh, in the apartment. And behind me were my early artworks in photography. And uh, yeah, during that time, uh, we meet a lot of different people through me. Australian, you know, people who worked in Australia, embassy, and some friends from other countries, and Nick's friend, Jaya, as the party. Yeah. Yeah. I think the screen. <laughs> And now I come to 
So a lot of history there, fascinating, and luckily your photographer captured all these images. I'm sure it's fascinating for Nick to see as well, I can't remember those things. Our next two speakers are from China, and um, uh, their connections with uh, Professor Nicholas Jones are through Australian literature and translation of Australian <coughs> writers. Um, due to COVID restrictions, they can't be with us in person, so we will play their uh, recorded a speech. Firstly, Professor Li Yao, who is virtually the translator of Australian literature in China and possibly around the world. He has translated so far 40 books by Australian writers and keeps going. And uh, uh, Professor Li Yao and I leading this uh, contemporary Australian writers program, uh, translation program um, uh, sponsored by FASIC, so we're so pleased. The other speaker is Professor Wang Jinghui, who is the Deputy Director of Australian Studies Centre at Tsinghua University, uh, one of um, over 36 such centres across China. Her specialty is in uh, post-colonial studies, 20th century literary theory, uh, and uh, Australian studies, as well as culture translations, with a special interest in uh, J.M. Kati. So let's listen to their speeches. Good afternoon, Professor Nicholas Zeus. Good afternoon, Professor Nicholas Zeus. Good afternoon, Professor Han Jin. Hello, everyone. In April 1988, 
Precisely 33 years ago, I attended the first international conference on Australian studies at Beijing Foreign Studies University. At the conference, I first met Niklas Zuz, tall and handsome, and he left a deep impression on me. At the time, he was the cultural counselor at the Australian Embassy in Beijing. Before the conference was closed, he and Professor Shirley Walker offered me an invitation to the 10th Association for the Study of Australian Literature held at the University of Sydney in August 1988. That was the first time that I set my foot on the land of Australia. During the conference, Nick Zeus arranged for me to meet Patrick White. My dream to meeting the greatest Australian author came true. After that, I embarked on my lifelong journey of translating Australian literature. Over the past 33 years, I have translated 40 books by Australian writers, ranging from literature, culture to history, and half of them were recommended by Nick Zeus. He posted me many important works, including Benign from the Heart, Carpentaria, Words of Passage, and The Ancestor Game. When people asked me how I would choose books for translation, I would respond with great pride, Nick Zeus's choice is my choice. As a matter of fact, my experience with translating Australian literature was made possible and all the more rewarding by the unreserved support from Nick Zeus, who has been a wonderful friend with a great knowledge of Australian literature. That's why I always refer to Nick Zeus as my Guiren. Guiren meaning a person who has had a significant impact on my life and career. So I wrote an article in Chinese entitled Nicholas Zhou's The Ambassador of Australia-China Culture Exchange. This article gave a comprehensive introduction of his family background, his life story, and the important contributions he made to the cultural exchanges between China and literary Australia. The article was published in the Journal of Literature and Art in China. I have also translated four novels by Nick Zeus, Avenue of Eternal Peace, The Custodians, The Rose Crossing, and The Red Thread. All of them were very well received by Chinese readers. Last year, I translated his beautiful cultural essay, the story of the Moon Boom, which will be published by the Journal of World Literature in China. I have also had several enjoyable trips with Nick Zeus in China and Australia. 33 years later, after we first met, our health have turned gray, but our hearts remain young, and we will continue our efforts to contribute to China-Australia cultural exchanges. I wish Nick Zeus good health and happiness. Thank you. I'm Wang Jinghui from Tsinghua University. It's my honor and pleasure to join this event in appreciation of Nick's work. In the spirit of brevity, I will discuss two of his books that I personally love best, The Red Thread and The Ba Po. In Chinese culture, The Red Thread functions similarly to the Romance Cubit's arrow, an invisible thread that connects kindred souls, irrespective of differences. This mythical bond that can link more than just individual people and can stretch across borders and over oceans, it may tangle, but it will never break. When introducing why he adapted the book Six Chapters of a Floating Life, Nick said that, literature travels and moves. It itself is a thread that connects people through time and space. I could not agree more. I would like to offer another example in support of this. Three years ago in Chengdu, I was invited to host an event 
in which Nick and Josephine Wilson met with Chinese readers. While in the taxi from the airport to the hotel, I was trying to finish the last chapter of Josephine's novel, Cusp. In it, there was a scene of a daughter complaining to her mother. Why don't you call when you got sick? The mother replied, I wanted you to have a chance. A chance for what? A chance to leave me behind while you could. Upon reading this, I burst into tears, frightening the taxi driver. He did not know that moment cured the pain which had been tormenting me for six months. In those moments of my life, I was drowning in guilt, hating myself that I was unable to make it back home to say a last goodbye to my mother before she passed away. I tried to keep myself busy with writing, with work. I tried anything that I thought might ease the horrible, angry grief that haunted every waking moment. In that cramped, musty backseat of a taxi, it was as though my mother's voice was ringing through the words on the pages before me. Keep walking onwards. Stop turning back for ghosts. Remember that I love you. That moment felt truly magic. A spell weaved into this Antipodean book. When it is said that literature connects us across the boundaries of time and space, it is through this. Through an all-encompassing tapestry of shared emotions, tied with threads, each distinct and beautiful. Friends we have all made, loves we have each lost, family members that shine iridescent. Through the words of literature, we find our souls, given voice by the characters who speak to our hearts. Ba Po also has another Chinese name, Jin Hui Dui, which literally means precious ashes. A characteristic of Ba Po painting is that though the eight key elements in it may seem old and chaotic, a successful authentic masterpiece can only be crafted by a multidisciplinary master. I greatly admire Nick's use of Ba Po as the title for his collection of short stories. I also want to say that his work as a whole has created its own precious piece of Ba Po painting that I'm sure will inspire understanding and empathy, unhindered by time or space. Thank you, thank you, Professor Wang Jinghui and Li Yao for their great speech. I'll give them up over a month to prepare so they have done a great job. Now it is the time for the main course, the steak. Um, the Vice Chancellor has made a, such a nice introduction of a Professor Nicholas Jones in the opening speech. Nick has done and achieved so much across so many areas: Australia and China, Australian and Chinese arts and history, fiction and non-fiction writing, Australian studies, international and intercultural relations, teaching, uh, researching, publishing, just a list of few. And uh, our guest speakers all shared their very special connections with Professor Nicholas Jose. And many of us here today uh, have either known Nick or worked with Nick or know about Nick. So I first, I first met Nick in 1986 in China uh, when Nick was a teaching at the Beijing Foreign Studies University. Um, I, uh, and was the examiner, probably Nick don't remember, I remember clearly. Uh, he was the examiner at my oral defense for my master thesis. And this picture was uh, taken at the first, Liao uh, mentioned, at the first international conference on Australian studies uh, in China uh, in April 1988. And that's Nick, young and stunning handsome. And that's me, anonymous student. <laughs> and that's Professor Hu Wenzhong, my supervisor. And you can also see Professor Li Yao and Professor Carilla Gantner, who was the predecessor of Nick being a cultural counselor in Beijing Embassy. 
Right after the conference, I left Beijing for Sydney University to do my PhD. So I got reconnected with Nick in 2011 at the first China Australian Literary Forum, CUF. Today, we are so honoured and thrilled to have the opportunity to celebrate Professor Nicholas Joe's extraordinary achievements as a writer, as a diplomat, as a scholar, and as a researcher, and his monumental contributions in the artistic and the literary exchange between Australia and China. Now, please welcome the one and only <laughs> Professor Nicholas Joe to give us Australian China Institute for Arts and Culture. 2021 Well, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, Vice Chancellor, and thank you, um, Jing. Thank you all for these amazing, kind words. Um, let me start, though. Um, by also acknowledging that we meet on the country of the Darug people, of the Darug nation, whose ancestors have been traditional owners of their country for thousands of years. And let me pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. That is the appropriate thing to say when the theme of this talk today is also meeting with respect and in hope. Now, when Professor Jing Han approached me about this address, I mean, I had no idea <laughs> what I was <laughs> letting myself in for. Um, all she said was that I should just talk about myself, um, which I usually don't like doing, but in the context of this address, it seemed like quite a good idea. Um, and I hope you won't mind, but that is what I'm going to do. Uh, but I believe there is a larger point to it. Um, but I must also say it's, it's kind of beyond embarrassing <laughs> to have been garlanded <laughs> in this way or ambushed <laughs> or, or whatever it is. OK. Um, the, the images that were scrolling past at the beginning, um, many of them illustrate um, things I'm saying in this talk, or they're images of people I mentioned. So um, perhaps you can just um, keep that in mind. My first trip to Beijing um, was in 1983 with a group, a student group from the Canberra College of Advanced Education, as it then was. I had returned from postgraduate study at Oxford to a lectureship in English at ANU in 1978. And I had enrolled, enrolled in Chinese as a hobby. I was inspired to do that by an American friend in Oxford, Alex Kerr, and there was a photo of him, who had grown up in Japan, was fluent in Japanese, and had gone on to study Chinese and Tibetan. He said to me, if I wanted to be a citizen of the world, I should study Chinese. What he meant was that Chinese thought, arts, culture, history, and ways of doing things were such a large part of human civilization by any definition that an educated person needed to know about it. Back in Canberra in 1978, I interpreted that idea as having more immediate relevance to Australia and to myself as an Australian a geopolitical shift was underway. China, which had been largely closed for decades, was now opening. That was the word that China used. With economic and political reforms, and intellectually and creatively too. I was curious, I wanted to go there, and that would prove life-changing. I'd already been to Hong Kong and to Taiwan, and I'd actually spoken some Mandarin in a real life situation in a stopover in Rangoon in 1980, uh, by the time I got to Beijing in 1983. But there, that opening up was palpable. People shared their sense of optimism after the damaging years of the Cultural Revolution. I could actually meet people, actual people, 
individuals, some of whom are friends to this day. On the long train journeys around the country in that brief tour, I listened to the stories people told, as I've done ever since, marvelling at life experiences that I struggled to compare with mine. How many deep conversations have begun from those candid questions asked of a stranger? Where do you come from? How old are you? Are you married? How much money do you make? <laughs> I returned to Australia determined to revisit, and by 1986 I was back in China with a visa to teach English and an idea of writing creatively about the experience. I was able to do that with support from the Australia-China Council and the Australia Council, with special help in putting it all together from Dr Jocelyn Che, who was then the director of the ACC. An organisation created in the early years of diplomatic relations to encourage people-to-people -people exchanges, particularly in the arts in the belief that a more holistic understanding between the two very different worlds of Australia and China would need careful nurturing and that shared creative interaction was one good way to do it. One of the Australia-China Council's early initiatives was support for students and among the first was Claire Roberts who studied Chinese painting at the Central Academy in Beijing in 1980, and there were photographs of that, before going on to her successful career as a curator and art historian with a focus on China. Claire is one of the ACC's best investments, <laughs> you might say, um, or I can certainly say, um, as we've shared our lives together in this space, since first meeting at the Museum of Chinese Australian History in Melbourne in 1987. And I'm very happy that Claire is here today. Sadly though, the Australia-China Council, so respected on both sides, was retired in 2019, one year after its 40th anniversary. That was not long after Malcolm Turnbull, then PM, reportedly confessed to China advisor Linda Jacobsen, China's just too hard. <laughs> and not long after Peter Drysdale, senior ANU economist, observed that China expertise among policymakers in Canberra was the thinnest it has ever been. Anyway, I was on a steep learning curve when I arrived in Beijing in 1986. I taught English and Australian literature at Beijing Foreign Studies University before moving on to Shanghai to teach at East China Normal University. The Australian Studies Centres at those two universities were among the first in a network that has since grown to 37 such centres, according to Professor Chan Hong, director at ECNU, in an interview earlier this month in which he noted increasing Chinese interest in studying Australia. He says, Australia is indeed a country with noteworthy highlights in culture, society, education and politics. Perhaps including the cancellation of his visitor's visa last year, along with the visa, visa of his Beijing counterpart, our colleague Li Zhenjun, director of the Australian Studies Centre at BFSU. Back then, as well as my teaching responsibilities, I wanted to write a novel that had connections between China and Australia as part of the story, which was also part of my family story. Uh, my grandfather was born in Ningbo in, 18, in the 1890s, um, where uh, his father was working as a missionary, and there were a couple of photos of him too. That novel would be published in 1989 as Avenue of Eternal Peace, my third, and filmed for television as Children of the Dragon. But what was happening on the ground in Beijing also became part of the story. I immersed myself in the city, determined to communicate as best I could. 
Two books in particular helped me understand what was going on. The Gate of Heavenly Peace, The Chinese and Their Revolution, by historian Jonathan Spence, which took the story of China's artists and intellectuals up to the Democracy Wall period of 1978-9. And Seeds of Fire, Chinese Voices of Conscience, edited by translators Jeremy Barme and John Minford, both linked to ANU, that was published in 1986 and gathered together a new generation's creative dissent, some of it produced by people who were living right nearby to me in Zhongguan Sun. That year in Beijing, I was privileged to meet people whose work and life appeared in both those books. And it was perhaps the best possible incentive for improving my Chinese. I had caught culture fever. <laughs> By 1986, writes Monash University scholar Gloria Davies, culture fever had become the term of choice for the burgeoning intellectual discourse and related forms of cultural production that developed alongside China's economic reforms. Culture fever was hailed as a new enlightenment movement that brought the thrill of discovering the human condition anew. For me, this took the form of unofficial art exhibitions that came and went quickly. Books, videos, cassette tapes that were copied and passed on. Poetry readings that were like rock concerts. And yes, democracy salons in which intellectuals of all ages and types debated future options for China. I remember one packed poetry reading in an outdoor auditorium at Peking University in 1988, where the students chanted, who do we want? We want Nietzsche. <laughs> Did I imagine that? <laughs> By then, I was working as cultural counsellor at the Australian Embassy, and I would report such things at our weekly meetings to raised eyebrows. I don't know how I got that job. I credit it to the visit to Beijing by Susan Ryan as Education Minister in 1986, when Ross Garno was ambassador. I was invited to dinner at the embassy by Carillo Gantner, who was then the cultural counsellor, because I was teaching Australian studies. And Susan Ryan was interested in that, especially Australian literary studies in China, as part of a widening educational exchange program. I could see the potential of that too, as Australia was opening in response to China's opening, and that educational relationship would become part of my job as cultural counsellor from 1987 to 1990. The point is that while some people reach a view of China through economic or political analysis, my sense of what was going on around me came largely through the arts and education. Such differing perspectives contribute to a multi-dimensional, balanced, but sometimes contradictory illumination of China in all its complexibility and variability. The arts were my education. The visual art I saw communicated with shocking immediacy and inventiveness, telling a different story from both the official China and the China that was visible in Australia at the time. The fact that this art could be made and shown at all was an indication of ferment and potential and dramatically challenged stereotypes. It was one of the so-called misty poets who, a year in advance, predicted the massive unrest that would erupt in 1989 and warned me not to miss it. The arts have intuitions and insights like nothing else, revealing energies at work beneath the surface. Open and supported channels of cultural and educational exchange give us access to that. And that's why I'm pleased to be speaking here today at the Australia China Institute for Arts and Culture, which has such an important place in our present difficult landscape. The Chinese culture fever of the late 1980s 
reached Australia as creative exchanges gained momentum. It provided the context in which exciting new Chinese artists were welcomed here, as we've heard, including Guanwei Xiao Shen and his brother A Shen, Xiao Lu, who's Xiao Lu is here, here, Shen Jia Wei, and many others, many of whom showed at Sherman Galleries in the 1990s. As the culture fever spread in Sydney, a creative redefinition was underway that saw new cultural interactions, not just with China, but with other parts of Asia and the Pacific, and including those communities within Australia, across all the art forms in an increasingly diverse and boundary crossing expression of who we are and what we can do. As cultural counsellor, I had been able to share that culture fever with Australians visiting China. I helped William Young, for example, with his first return to his ancestral homeland when he travelled with Inner Mongolian photographer Bao Na Yong. There was a visual arts education delegation consisting of Betty Churcher, Jeff Parr and David Williams, all in senior positions at the time, who were so impressed by what they saw that they envisaged a new international art network in which Australia could play a role, and which led in time to Queensland Art Gallery's groundbreaking and continuing Asia-Pacific Triennial. In 1986, um, I helped organise that first Australian Studies Conference in China um, that we've just been looking at um, in Beijing, attended by Donald Horne, um, as chair of the Australia Council at the time, and Faye Zwicky, the poet, among quite a few Australian writers. This accelerated the translation and publishing of Australian books, and in turn, Chinese writers and publishers were welcomed to festivals and residencies in Australia. And in time, an Australian Writers' Week in China was initiated in 2007 by Jeff Raby when he was ambassador. It was not always easy, and difficulties on both sides have to be recognised. If we are a nation that tends to forget the past, the Chinese have longer memories. Back in Australia, I was interested in carrying forward the possibilities for interaction that were emerging in those years of culture fever. There were new initiatives in Sydney, in particular, with Foray Centre for Contemporary Asian Art, for example, and with Heat Magazine and then Giramondo Publishing, and with the Sydney Centre of International Pen, of which I was president, in a new involvement with Chinese writers. I worked with Ivo Indic, Ian Ang, Annette Chun War, Melissa Cho, and others, and connected with what was happening here at Western Sydney University. There were translation workshops and residencies in China, novels by Julia Lee, who is here, and Gail Jones were published uh, in Chinese in translation as a result. I kept on writing my own work. The China-Australia Literary Forum began in 2011 as a partnership between the Chinese Writers' Association and Western Sydney University's Writing and Society Research Centre, building on what had gone before. Li Yao, who had previously translated Patrick White, saw his translation of Carpentaria by Alexis Wright, launched by Mo Yen in Beijing in 2012. The literary forum, known as CAF, has grown into a regular meeting involving distinguished writers in both countries, including Nobel laureates J.M. Kurtzi and Mo Yen in dialogue in Beijing in 2013. Each time it has seemed like an experiment, as its most recent conveners, Anthony Yulman and Jing Han and Kate Fagan, um, will attest, I'm sure. But it's the nature of literature to ask questions, and it's the work of translation to seek answers. 
calf then fed into the larger ARC funded project that Anthony Yulman led on other worlds, forms of world literature, of which this book, which we'll launch in a minute, Antiquity in China, is a product. The arts. I use the term not only to refer to the creative arts, but the arts more generally as we speak of them in the academy, also known as the humanities. The arts are an indispensable part of educating ourselves for life in the world. Here too, China offers guidance. My subtitle, The Importance of the Arts, alludes to a popular book by Lin Yutang, The Importance of Living, written and published in English in 1938, in the middle of world crisis. The author's list of arts includes the art of reading, the art of writing, the arts of food and drink and flower arrangement, the art of conversation, even the art of lying in bed. The arts of living as understood in Chinese tradition. Important among them is the art of thinking on which the book concludes. Humanized thinking, a spirit of reasonableness in Lin Yutang's words. He ends with the hope that eventually we shall be able to live peacefully because we shall have learned to think reasonably. The arts of peace rather than the art of war. The arts invite us into a conversation. As children have their curiosity aroused and then guide us in how to respond and how to extend that conversation. It's a conversation that connects the living with the dead in one channel of vitality, in the words of Lao Tzu that I quoted in Avenue of Eternal Peace. Mm -hmm. As an intense form of communication, the arts create communities, imagining how we might live together how we might change things across difference and distance. Yes, it's hard, but the arts make difficulty interesting and productive. The arts keep communication possible when other lines are down. Artists and scholars can always take each other's phone calls. These things are so obvious, they shouldn't need saying. But right now, there's a lot at stake. There's work to do. Thank you for being part of that by being here today. In this long game, maybe the best is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Such a rich speech. Lots of um, things to reflect on, lots of memory, memories to go back to. And you know, you mentioned the mission, missionary of grandfather led you to China. It's me, it's opposite. My mum went to missionary school in Qingdao. She studied a bit of English, so she insisted I study English. While well, my dream was going to textile factory to be a worker. So she said no. So it's. Um, yeah, it's just amazing, amazing speech. I feel so, so moved. And there is no way, no better way to conclude this event than having the opportunity to launch the latest book by Nick, uh, Antipode and China Reflections on Literary Exchange, co edited with Benjamin Madden, published by Jeromondo. And we are very fortunate today to have um, Professor Ava Indik as the um, Professor I, Nicholas Jones, a long-standing colleague and a publisher to launch the book. 
Uh, as the Australian's most prestigious literary publisher and distinct, distinguished literary critic, uh, Professor Ivor Indic has been vital in the um, literary exchange between Australia and China and to the success of the CAF in particular, with a small incidental price. CAF 2 was held in 2013 in Beijing and on a raining day, we needed to go to Peking uh, University for a special session. The group included professors James Curti, David Walker, Ivor Indyk, Anthony Ullman, and Peter Hutchins, I believe. And so we needed a bigger taxi. I finally held down a taxi, and then taxi driver had a glance at the group, demanded 400 yuan for 10 minutes of drive, three times higher than the standard price. I asked him why. He said, he looks like a very rich, very wealthy professor, indicating Professor Ivor Indyk. <laughs> Please welcome very wealthy looking professor, Professor Ivor Indyk, to launch the book and give a speech. Um, I, I think I was the only person with grey hair in the taxi bus, um, and that well, why he thought I was wealthy, I don't know. There was no other reason that I could see. Um, it's my honour to uh, present to you, uh, to launch, uh, Nick's latest book, uh, his latest publication, Antipodean China, uh, which, as Nick mentions, mentioned, and Jing Tu, um, celebrates and commemorates um, a remarkable period in retrospect of uh, more than 10 years, more than a decade, in which Australian and Chinese writers uh, uh, collaborated in an exchange in both China and Australia, in uh, Sydney, in Beijing, in Melbourne, in Guangzhou. Um, the uh, interactions were always quite awkward, as you can imagine, because of the uh, we didn't speak Chinese, most of us, except for Nick and Jing, and uh, the Chinese writers didn't speak English. So there was a tremendous desire, clearly on both sides, to, to relate, uh, to take advantage of a, a unique situation, uh, to make ourselves understood to the other. Uh, and all the time, uh, there was Nick. Um, he was the instigator, really. Um, from the beginning uh, at a um, translation workshop in Suzhou in 2009. Um, and then it was largely because of Nick's presence at, at this university in the uh, Writing and Society Research Centre, I think, that we were approached by the Chinese Ministry of Culture and the Chinese Writers Association uh, to host uh, a delegation of 10 Chinese writers uh, who would be matched with 10 Australian writers. Uh, this was in 2011. Uh, we had many sponsors over the years, uh, but the constant factors were uh, the University of Western, uh, Western Sydney, Western Sydney University, um, through the uh, Writer, Writing and Society Research Centre, the uh, Australia China Council, DFAT, uh, Copyright Agency Limited, the Australia Council. There were a lot of stakeholders and there was a lot of interest uh, in having this, um, you know, this rather unique exchange uh, succeed. But Nick was there at the beginning and he guided it throughout uh, uh, with a firm but discreet hand. Um, and he was always there, you know, to explain to both sides actually and to facilitate the communication. I should say that Jing was also there from the beginning. And I remember uh, at the first session, the first symposium in 2011, uh, getting excited because, you know, I could talk to the Chinese, but I couldn't talk Chinese. And I'd yell across the room, Jing, Jing, come. I need to talk to so-and-so. Um, but after a while, after a number of these um, exchanges, I began to believe I could speak Chinese. <laughs> Especially at the banquets, where I, <laughs> uh, where I, um, I really enjoyed the Chinese wine, <laughs> and where I was um, ambushed into a competition with a Chinese eminent Chinese writer, who wanted to take me down a peg, 
And um, uh, you know, we kept, he kept toasting me, so I kept toasting him back. And uh, soon, after a while, he was under the table and I was still <laughs> upright. <laughs> and I don't drink much. And what he didn't realise is that I wasn't drinking much. Uh, and so I was taking a sip while he was taking a whole cup. <laughs> but it could be because I was so intoxicated by the idea of being in China from the beginning, from 2011, and the whole process, that I couldn't get much drunker than I was uh, already. I was already high, so to speak, <laughs> uh, so that the alcohol didn't make any difference to me. That was one moment um, when you, know, you could really believe that the exchange was happening in a very intimate way. And when he was putting together this collection, Nick suggested I write an introduction called The Kiss. And this referred to yet another episode where in 2011 at the first exchange, um, I got on very well with a, an author, female author, <laughs> Sheng Ke Yi, um, who wrote an important book uh, and I was very keen to publish it. And our conversation about this had started earlier in 2009, so uh, we'd known each other for quite a while. And after the um, um, forum ended, uh, Nick and I were standing on the footpath uh, outside uh, while the Chinese delegation got on their bus uh, to take them to the airport. And there was a bit of a delay. And I thought, I didn't really want to say goodbye to Shen Ki, so I jumped on the bus and in the European fashion planted a kiss uh, on each of her cheeks. Well, you know, suddenly the bus was full of eyes. <laughs> um, so that's the incident that he was referring to. Innocent, I should say, completely innocent. But, you know, in the spirit of, um, of intimacy, of exchange. And there were other episodes like that as well. Um, one which isn't, these aren't in the book, by the way, but uh, a special one which Jing Han presided over between Mo Yan and uh, John Katsia, the two Nobel Prize winners at the forum in Beijing when uh, they appeared on their first panel together and um, John Katsia was wearing a leather jacket and an open white shirt and uh, Mo Yan was very proper, you know, in a suit, monochrome suit <laughs> and uh, tie and shirt and um, he must have felt uncomfortable, you know, that uh, uh, Katsia was so relaxed and he was so um, formal. He came under attack from other Chinese writers as well for n winning the Nobel Prize, but that was another matter. Anyway, the next day there was a second panel and um, overnight uh, Jing told me that the Chinese press had um, criticised uh, Mo Yan for being too rigid and not being relaxed, you know, like, uh, like the Australian Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> And so the very next day, who should turn up in a leather jacket exactly the same, <laughs> exactly the same as my aunt, uh, as uh, John could see, it's with a white open neck shirt, uh, and so they were totally identical uh, on the stage. <laughs> so it was that kind of you know desire uh, to meet the other, to be the other, uh, in some senses, which uh, this um, book commemorates. Uh, Nick wasn't satisfied with just recording uh, those events, but he expands them in this book, so it contains essays, essays fiction, poetry, uh, by writers, translators, critics, uh, academics. Uh, so although it doesn't contain those intimate moments, and it couldn't, because <laughs> I couldn't write the, the essay called The Kiss, of course, um, it nevertheless celebrates what looks now, in retrospect, given the standoff between the two countries, uh, an idyllic period, really, uh, for all its fumbling and its awkwardness. Uh, and uh, I hope they'll come again. Um, it's to be noted that the initiative, in the first instance, uh, came from the Chinese Ministry of Culture. So I hope it'll happen, and I'm sure it will eventually. <laughs> so in the meantime, I just wanted to congratulate Nick and to say what a pleasure it was working with him and uh, to say how pleased I am and I'm sure the other contributors to the uh, decade-long exchange uh, are that he has put the effort into uh, commemorating that whole experience. Thanks. <laughs>
I think I... What I would like to do um, is read out um, the names of some of the contributors to the book because it is, it is quite a list, um, actually. So um, on the cover, the cover here we have Alai, um, who is a Tibetan Chinese writer, and he appears in an extended exchange with Alexis Wright um, across several encounters and meetings, and includes a incredible um, reading of her novel Carpentaria by Alai in a book review that was published in China. So that's the first section of the book. Um, it ends with the dialogue between the two Nobel Prize winners, um, J.M. Kurtzi and Mo Yen, um, in Beijing in 2013. And in the middle, um, it's, it's very various, um, many different viewpoints, many different approaches, um, but we have um, writers such as Dorothy Tsi, a short story writer from Hong Kong, uh, that's translated from Cantonese into English by um, Natasha Bruce. Um, we have Zhong Xiaochung, um, who's a remarkable um, poet from southern China, who is one of the um, internal migrants who worked in those factories in the Pearl River Delta, uh, making iPhones and things, and became the poetic voice of those people in her work. Um, Alexis Wright, I've mentioned Brian Castro, um, you would all know, uh, Julia Lee, who is here, Gail Jones, um, our colleague. Um, other important Chinese writers, Shun Ke Yi, the woman who got the kiss from <laughs> Iva. Um, Xi Chuan, uh, a, a wonderful Chinese poet um, who writes about his journey through Latin America as a kind of parallel between the writer of the journey of a Chinese writer to the south, to Australia. Um, Kate Fagan, poet, um, who is also here, and um, the writer who tried to drink Iva under the table, was it Li Jun Yun? <laughs> I think so. Li Jun Yun, yeah. Um, and, and various others, um, including a section, important section in the middle about translation, because without translation, none of this can easily happen. It's called the translator's task, um, and it consists of different approaches to, to translating. Uh, one piece by Li Yao, who we've seen, um, one piece by Ouyang Yu, Chinese Australian poet who translates himself, um, and um, an essay by Benjamin Madden, my um, co-editor, um, reflecting on Simon Lay's, Pierre Rickman's um, in China and Australia. So it, 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 it's a book that does um, celebrate and record a phase of life between Australia and China creatively and imaginatively. Um, there's a slew of books about China coming out at the moment. Um, this one is different um, because it is in many voices. Half of them are Chinese. Um, and so this sense of dialogue is the word I've been using, but it's not always dialogue. Sometimes it's like direct contradiction. Um, you read from one essay to the other and you think, oh, isn't that person saying the exact opposite of what the one before was saying? Yes, they are. And as editors, we didn't want to smooth that over. We just present it, and there it is. So um, I hope you, you find the book interesting. Um, yeah. You can sign some. I can sign some, and other people can perhaps sign as well. Um, I, I would like to thank Giramondo Publishing, um, Iva, and his colleagues for working with me through this process. It actually has been a very complicated book to do. Uh, it didn't just kind of assemble itself. Um, and it, it's been um, a, a very good experience. Um, should we also add that um, 
The Australian taxpayer has contributed to it through the Australian Research Council grant that we had called Other Worlds. And I end with that because if you were listening to my talk, you would notice how much Australian government agencies over this period have supported things. Without that, we really are at a loss. And this is perhaps not a, 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 such an upbeat note to end on, but I would say it's really, really hard at the moment to not only get the funding from such agencies, but get the, the interest, um, the belief, um, even in a university context, the very mention of the word China um, can send you know, managers into a, a kind of a cold sweat. We're at a very, very strange time, um, but something like this, and if we can have, if we can advocate for the value of things like this so that that support continues to come in its various forms. Okay. <laughs> Both of you have said it all, so I don't have more to add. I just would like to thank our gods, Jesus and the Buddha, for the success of today's event. Without the support of the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Barney Glover, and our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Deborah Sweeney, and without the, uh, our special, uh, highly distinguished guest speakers, um, and, of course, without the main course, the soul of this event, Professor Nicholas Jones, and his historical address. Lastly, but not least, without my assistant and uh, project, uh, project officer Lena, Lena Gong, and our wonderful, wonderful volunteer team, we couldn't have done it. Our heartfelt thanks also goes to everyone who, who, are, who is here today. Lastly, I would like to announce that our newly installed art exhibition, Zhao Da Lu exhibition, The Lives, is officially open. Zhao Da Lu is a highly renowned Chinese Australian artist based in Melbourne. Thanks to the very generous support from Professor Karila Gantner AC and Ziying Gantner, we are able to bring Zhao Da Lu's uniquely beautiful artworks to our gallery. You are invited to view the exhibition if you haven't got the chance to do so. Due to the latest COVID situation in Melbourne, Zhao Dalu is not able to come today. So he has asked me to pass on his best wishes and regards to everyone. Please also get your book and get signed and, um, by Nick and enjoy the wine and the canopies uh, in the foyer. The one I need to acknowledge is a journalist provided by our sponsor, Oswan, and is the CEO of One d Mao. So thank you, Nick, and thank you, Claire, and thank you, Vice-Chancellor, and thanks, everyone. Good evening. and then